Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the William G. McGowan Theater at the National Archives. And a, welcome, a special welcome to those of you who are joining us on our YouTube channel. Today's program takes us back to the Jacksonian period when the President of the United States, in one of his first actions, ordered the expulsion of Native Americans from their lands in the American South to lands west of the Mississippi in a journey westward known as the Trail of Tears. We'll learn more about the, fi the flight the fight against Jackson's order from today's guest, but first I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs here in the McGowan Theater. Tomorrow night at seven, we'll present the ninth annual Charles Guggenheim tribute program, Monument to the Dream. This film is Charles, Guggen Charles Guggenheim's Oscar-nominated short documentary on the building of the St. Louis uh, Memorial Arch, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Recently digitally restored, the film will soon play at a new museum and visitor center being build, built on the site, and a discussion will follow the screening. And as you leave the, um, the auditorium, if you've never noticed it before, there's one of Charles Guggenheim's Oscars uh, in a case outside. Thursday at noon, we'll host Senator Mike Lee of Utah, who will discuss his book, Our Lost Constitution, The Willful Subversion of America's Founding Document. In it, Senator Lee explains why some of today's issues are the direct result of minimizing or ignoring what he considers to be the most important provisions of the Constitution, and a book signing will follow the program. If you want to know more about these and all of our upcoming programs, please refer to our monthly calendar events. There are copies in the lobby as well as a sign-up sheet where you can receive it in the regular mail or by email. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities, and there are applications for membership also in the lobby. Our guest today is Steve um, Inskeep, host of NPR's Morning Edition, the most widely heard radio program in the United States. Inskeep joined NPR in 1996, uh, and his full-time assignment was the 19, first full-time assignment was the 1996 presidential primary in New Hampshire. He's also covered the Pentagon, the Senate, and the 2000 presidential campaign of George W. Bush. After the September 11th, 2001 attack, he covered the war in Afghanistan, turmoil in Pakistan, and the war in Iraq. In 2003, he received a National Headliner Award for investigating a military raid gone wrong in Afghanistan. He has twice been part of the NPR news teams that received the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Silver Baton for coverage of Iraq. During the 2008 presidential campaign, he and NPR's Michelle Norris conducted the York Project, groundbreaking conversations about race, which also received and Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Silver Baton for Excellence Award. Inskeep is the author of Instant City, Life and Death in Karachi, a 2011 book on one of the world's great megacities. The book he will discuss today is Jackson Land, a forthcoming history of Andrew, President Andrew Jackson's long-running conflict with John Ross, a Cherokee chief who resisted the Jackson-ordered removal of Indians from the eastern United States in the 1830s. In a Washington Post review of the book, David Troyer wrote, the story of the Cherokee removal has been told many times, but never before has a single book given us such a sense of how it happened and what it meant, not only for Indians, but also for the future and soul of America. Please join me in welcoming um, Steve Inskeep. That, uh, glad that you came out and joined us on your, your lunch hour. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this discussion, especially in this location. Uh, David kindly mentioned that I've covered a lot of things in the world. I look at my job essentially as covering democracy. That's the story we're telling on NPR. It's like a giant mini-series with too many characters, very badly plotted, lots of plot twists. Democracy, that's what we do. And this story, Jackson Land, is in my mind the backstory of democracy, the backstory of the politics that I cover uh, every day here in the United States. I know that it will surprise you 
that when you cover political issues every day, that it's sometimes a tiny bit frustrating. <laughs> and three or four years ago, it got exceptionally frustrating for me, and I had to go in some direction, and I decided to go back into history, to go back to our beginnings, to try to get a better sense of how things became as they are. Now, the first thing that I discovered in going back into the 19th century particularly was alcohol. Uh, whiskey, rye whiskey, uh, which America was pretty much drunk on for the entire uh, 19th century. And when you hear this story or any other story about the 19th century, you should keep in mind that a large percentage of the characters, whether the author notes it or not, are probably ripped a good percentage of the time. So I thought a lot about whiskey. I even bought a little bit of rye whiskey. I became a bit of a connoisseur of rye whiskey, but that only takes you so far. And so I ended up with this other story, this story that centers on the 1830s, although it begins a little bit before. And it's a story of how our democracy came to take shape. And one of the reasons that I'm excited to talk about it here at the National Archives is because some of the research for this book was done here at the National Archives. We're looking here on the screen at a petition. This is a petition from the early 1830s. It's been preserved in a metal box here at the archives. And you will notice that the names signed on this petition, many of them are written in a non-English script. It's Cherokee. Cherokees in the early 19th century had developed and spread their own written version of their language, the first Indian nation to do so. They had the status of an independent nation, although they had accepted, in effect, the dominion of the United States. And they were, they were petitioning for their rights. They made petition after petition, and they were sent uh, to Congress and preserved here at the National Archives. Here's another one. These names are in English. Cherokees were petitioning. Their allies, as well as their opponents, within the larger white population of the United States at that time, were also sending petitions and making their arguments to Congress. This was a great democratic battle. Now, we learn a tiny bit about this in school, elementary school or junior high school. You learn about something called the Trail of Tears. And there are many people who are deeply into this history. Other people get just a little bit. You've heard about the Trail of Tears, haven't you? You've heard that phrase. Um, there is a lot more to the story I discovered than that. Essentially, what we're talking about here is real estate. This is a story of democracy. It's a story of politics. It's a story of diversity in America. But at the end, what we're looking at is a battle over the control of real estate. This is a little bit of the real estate in question. This is outside Florence, Alabama. What you see in the background behind the lovely horse are the ruins of a plantation house that was built in the 1820s by a friend of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson, this man, James Jackson, no relation, and a number of other friends had captured a vast amount of real estate, which is today referred to as northern Alabama or the Tennessee River Valley. They had colonized a large part of that real estate. They had managed to obtain large amounts of that real estate, tens of thousands of acres for themselves. And some of them established plantations and moved in. And these plantations were run by, by African slaves. What were learning about here is the creation of the American South, which happened in the early 19th century. This is a prequel to the Civil War, and it's also a prequel to the democratic debates of our time, the debates that I have to cover every day, because our democratic system was being worked out and many of our modern democratic institutions were being put into place. There are two vital characters in this story, and the first is a man who has come down to us as the hero of early American democracy, Andrew Jackson, seen here in 1815. This is a great painting. It's my favorite painting of Andrew Jackson because of the details of it, because he's not idealized in any way. This is a man who has just become a national hero because he was the victor of the Battle of New Orleans against the British, and also the Battle of Horseshoe Bend against a rebellious band of Creek Indians. 
And you see here a man in his late 40s. He's got some wrinkles around the eyes. He doesn't look that pleasant or happy to be there. You can even notice, if you look closely, he looks awfully thin in that uniform. This is a man who was terribly unhealthy most of his adult life, um, who suffered from horrible stomach pains during the War of 1812 so bad that the only way he could get relief while on the march was sometimes he would have an aide cut, cut down a sapling, a tree, and he would drape himself over the tree in a particular position where he would have temporary relief from the pain. And yet this man went ahead, drove his ramshackle improvised armies to victory, became a national hero and ultimately, ultimately president of the United States, and ended up on the $20 bill, where he remains today, although his image has become immensely more complex, to say the least, much darker, because of changing views of the story that I want to tell. That story involves another main character. This man is an Indian. He's a Cherokee. His name is John Ross. He's pictured here, I think, in the 1820s. And you can see a number of interesting things about John Ross. Uh, he's wearing white man's clothes. And in that, he was representative of the Cherokee Nation at that time. From the earliest days of the United States, Cherokees, who had long been a powerful and influential nation in the Southern Appalachians, had decided to adopt the ways of white civilization, as it was then phrased. They changed their clothing, they also changed their economy. They adopted what we would consider more modern forms of agriculture, for example. They changed their government in time, and John Ross was central in that. Ultimately, in the 1820s, the Cherokees adopted a constitution that in many ways was modeled on the Constitution of the United States, which you can see here in this building, of course. And John Ross was central to that change. The Cherokees were so assiduous in adopting the ways of their white neighbors, they even picked up the white man's practice of owning slaves. And they owned several thousand slaves at the time of this story. John Ross himself was a slave owner. Both of my main characters were slave owners. No one is a saint in this story. They were active in a time when the United States looked very different than it does today. And I'd like to give you a sense of that simply by describing, if I might, a boat ride that John Ross took at the end of 1812. He got in a boat with three other men. And, oh, goodness, I just dropped my... Uh, Thing there. We'll just put this down here, or I'll clip it back on. This will look good on YouTube, guys. He got on a boat with three other men, and they prepared to travel down the Tennessee River. They started near what is today Chattanooga, Tennessee. There was a very small settlement there at that time. The boat was loaded with trade goods. They were heading through what white men would then call wilderness was actually a succession of Indian nations heading down the Tennessee River toward the Ohio. They'd briefly be on the Ohio, then go down the Mississippi, then cross the Mississippi and head west. They wanted to trade with a band of Cherokees there. Anyone covertly studying the boat would have seen four men on board. John Ross was black-haired, brown-eyed, slight, but handsome. Each of his three companions could be described in a phrase a Cherokee interpreter, an older Cherokee man named Calcity, and a servant who was likely a slave. But Ross was harder to categorize. He was the son of a Scottish trader whose family had lived among Cherokees for generations in their homeland in the southern Appalachians. Ross was an aspiring trader himself, yet he also had a solid claim to his identity as an Indian, a man of mixed race, he had grown up among Cherokee children and, in keeping with Cherokee custom, received a new name at adulthood, Kuiskui, which was said to be a species of bird. Whether he was a white man or an Indian became a matter of life and death. On December 28, 
1812. In Kentucky, as Ross later recorded in a letter, we was hailed by a party of white men. The men on the riverbank called for the boat to come closer. Ross asked what they wanted. Give us the news, one of them called back. Something about Ross bothered the men. I told them we had no news worth their attention. Now the white men revealed their true purpose. One shouted that they had orders from a garrison of soldiers nearby to stop every boat descending the river to examine if any Indians was on board as they were not permitted to come about that place. Come to us, the men concluded, or we'll come to you. Ross didn't come. Damn my soul if those two are not Indians, one of the men shouted referring to two of Ross's crew. The man added that he would gather a company of men to pursue and kill them. Ross came up with an answer. Those two men are Spaniard, he said. The white men demanded the Spaniards prove their identity by speaking Spanish. Peter, the servant, actually could. But the white men still insisted it was an Indian boat and mounted their horses and galloped off. Ross had to assume the white men were serious. The United States had declared war on Britain that year, and some native nations had joined the British side, killing white settlers, fighting alongside British troops, and throwing the frontier into turmoil. The white horsemen would not pause to find out that Ross's Cherokees were loyal to the United States. The Cherokees could travel in only one direction and would have little chance to escape if the men on horseback arranged an unpleasant reception downstream. Ross decided on a precaution. He whitened the boat. He had told the horsemen there were no Indians on board, and the best chance of safety was to make this claim appear true. He modified the racial composition of his crew, leaving only those who could pass as non-Indian. Ross could pass, as could the Cherokee interpreter, who like Ross was an English speaker and a mixed blood, parlance for part white and part Indian. The servant, who may have been a black man, would be ignored. Only old Calcity was a full-blooded Cherokee with no chance to fool anybody. His mere presence might even cause the others to be perceived as Indians. This apparently was Ross's thinking because, as he confided later, we concluded it was good policy to let Calcity out of the boat. The old man would have to set off overland and meet the craft later. The remaining crew put their poles in the water and shoved the keelboat, keelboat toward whatever lay ahead. John Ross spent two anxious days on the water, and Calcity had a disagreeable walk of about 30 miles, probably along the bank opposite from where they'd seen the horsemen. Finally, the old man rejoined the boat downstream, and they all floated to a safe haven, Fort Massac on the Ohio River, manned by professional soldiers who could tell friend from foe. The horsemen never reappeared. Reflecting on this afterward, Ross said he was convinced that the independent manner in which I answered the horsemen had confounded their apprehension of it being an Indian boat. Indians were supposed to be children of the woods, in a common phrase of the era, dangerous but not too bright, and expected to address white men respectfully as elder brothers. Ross had talked back to the men in clear and defiant English. The future leader of the Cherokee Nation had passed as white. You can begin to sense there what is so appealing about this story. It feels very modern, doesn't it? We're talking about a man of mixed race in a very diverse America where there are many different kinds of people trying to figure out the rules under which they're going to live together and still fit together as one country. You hear about a man passing as one race or another. You hear about stories of racial conflict. It all sounds familiar and yet strangely different. 
for many reasons, one of them being that the map of the United States was different. I mentioned that this is about many things, but at heart about real estate. Let's look at some real estate. This is a map of the United States as it looks at the beginning of our story in 1812. And you can see that along the eastern seaboard, things look rather familiar. And as you head further west, things begin to get rather sketchy. But many things are recognizable there. You can see states like Tennessee, where Andrew Jackson moved as a young man from the Carolinas. You can see the state of Georgia there looks just the same on that particular map. You can see Mississippi Territory, which is about to become two states, Mississippi and Alabama. You can see Louisiana. Florida's there. It's still owned by Spain, but the United States is confident it's going to get that pretty soon. The further west you go, though, the more blank the map becomes. Now, you notice I didn't label it a map of the United States, although that's what it is. I labeled it the white man's map. That's because there were two different mutually exclusive maps of the same territory. There was a white man's map and an Indian map. We've zoomed in a little bit here, and we're now looking at what we would think of as the southern United States. But this time, we've looked, we've added in boundaries of land that was legally owned by independent or semi-independent Indian nations, sovereign Indian nations. The Cherokees, the Creeks, the Choctaws, the Chickasaws, the Seminoles are down there in Spanish Florida. You see the map looks very different. Georgia's just this small enclave, relatively small enclave, along the ocean. Tennessee doesn't look anything like it does. Mississippi Territory doesn't even exist. Even North Carolina is a little bit different shape. South Carolina is a little bit different shape there in 1812. Kentucky as well. This was the legal reality of that moment. Europeans had come. They had won by treaty or conquest the right to own the land to the east and to the north. But they had also, by treaty, confirmed, and the United States, its new government, had gone on to confirm the rights of the Indian nations to this land. And yet, this different map of the same territory was imagined at the same time. And that's the fundamental conflict of this book, is an effort to make these two conflicting maps into one. That battle would be fought out in our democratic system. And this is something that I did not fully realize before beginning my research on this book, before coming to the Library of Congress, before coming here to the National Archives, before taking road trips through the South and elsewhere and discovering many documents, discovering how vital it was to our early democracy, this battle, and how central the Indians themselves were to the fight. You do learn in school about Cherokees being forced along the Trail of Tears. And it is right that that is now taught in school. I just don't think it's the whole story. And I don't even need to tell you that I don't think that. The documents do not show that to be the whole story. The whole story is that Cherokees engaged themselves actively in their own defense. One of the reasons you saw John Ross in White Man's Clothes was that he was a man of mixed race. But another reason was the Cherokees were changing and adapting their culture in order to preserve their place in the Southern Appalachians and to have a role for themselves within this new dynamic and rapidly growing country. That was a deliberate political choice. The Cherokees, I came to think of them as almost as immigrants assimilating to a new country, except, of course, that the new country was coming to them to their ancient homelands. Some of the Indian nations and leaders within the Indian nations wished to remain fully independent from the United States. That was not John Ross's strategy, as this young man became increasingly identified with the Cherokee side of his identity and ultimately became the principal chief, the leader of the Cherokee nation. He wanted Cherokees to have a role within the United States. There's a letter from, I believe, 1816, in which John Ross writes, 
we consider ourselves to be a part of the great family of the Republic of the United States. Some Indians wanted out of this new country. The Cherokees wanted in. And they fought in many ways. They worked to assimilate, and when that did not appear to be enough, they worked to negotiate. And when they realized they needed a stronger government, John Ross and other Cherokees were among the leaders who established a new constitution, which was designed to strengthen their ability to hang on to their land. They fought with white allies. And there was not as great a convulsion as there would soon be over slavery in the United States, but there was a significant political convulsion which peaked just as our other main character, Andrew Jackson, was elected president of the United States in 1828. Jackson was a slightly imp imp impatient man and a determined man. He, in many ways, did come to symbolize the pattern of Western settlement that led to this tremendous conflict over the maps. He was born on the border between North and South Carolina. He was orphaned at a young age. His father died before he was born. His mother died when he was quite young uh, during the Revolutionary War, died of cholera. He moved west with nothing or next to nothing. He may have had a small inheritance. He became a lawyer, a largely self-educated lawyer, and, uh, and a brawler, and a drinker, and a fighter, uh, and also tried to make himself into an early version of a southern gentleman. And quite early in his life, purchased his first slave, a young woman. Controversy followed the whip-thin politician with the wiry hair. Although his ownership of slaves was unremarkable in Tennessee, he sometimes engaged in slave dealing, a business that even slave owners considered disreputable. He also endured criticism for his continuing tendency to challenge other men to duels, a practice that remained common but illegal. In 1806, Jackson let an exchange of insults with a Nashville man escalate into a duel and resolved to kill his opponent. Jackson let the other man shoot first, took a lead ball near his heart that would remain in his body for the rest of his life, and yet remained standing. He took time to be sure of his aim before firing a fatal shot in return. Unfortunately for Jackson, his antagonist was a popular young man whose death stained Jackson's reputation. And that reputation was already colored by scandal. It was widely known that he had been together with Rachel, his wife, for years before she completed her divorce from an abusive husband. Rachel and Andrew lived as husband and wife from 1790 or 91 onward, even though the formal decree ending her previous marriage did not arrive until 1793. They had to be remarried in 1794 to clear up doubts about their status. But having married, they cultivated a conventional family life. With no children of their own, they adopted their son Andrew Jr. from Rachel's relatives. When Jackson traveled, his miserable wife wrote him letters urging him to hurry home. He wrote back tenderly to express regret that he could not. The muddled circumstances of his marriage proved to be characteristic of Jackson. He took counsel of what he wanted, what his friends desired, and what he felt to be right. He was guided less by the norms of society than by what he considered just, as he wrote in his letters, often capitalizing the word. For his marriage to Rachel, the most romantic act of his life, he was willing to endure decades of whispers and insults. A darker manifestation of this characteristic came out in Jackson's slave trading. The social convention that it was acceptable to own human beings as property, but that only low-down characters would engage in the slave trade, would have been just the sort of elaborate hypocrisy by which Jackson refused to be governed. Modern readers can wish that he resolved this hypocrisy by rejecting both practices. Instead, he embraced them both when it suited his interests. 
His approach to slavery foreshadowed his approach to federal Indian policy. He would reject what he saw as its false piety and rewrite the policy in the way that suited people like himself. Until the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in 1814, until his service in that war, the record of Jackson's career suggests a talented man thrashing about in the dark, trying to locate a ladder that no man of his background had ever climbed. His speeches made an impression in the House of Representatives, but he left his seat. He served briefly in the Senate, but resigned and went home, becoming a justice on the Tennessee Supreme Court. He won election in 1802 as a major general in command of the Tennessee militia, but for years found no wars to fight. Like many a Westerner, and this was considered the West, by the way, Tennessee was the West. That was the frontier. Like many a Westerner, he speculated in land. He bought and sold the rights to tens of thousands of acres, including land alongside the Mississippi River that eventually became Memphis. It was common for speculators to buy the rights to Indian land and then press their politicians to clear it of Indians, pressure that Jackson, as a politician himself, was well connected to apply. But he made the mistake of dealing with men more dreamy-eyed than he was, and when one of his land sales unraveled, Jackson struggled to avoid bankruptcy and the risk of debtor's prison. That was long before the War of 1812 when his military and diplomatic triumphs opened new horizons for a man with a real estate background and business connections. During that war, he was a general in command of an army. When it was over, he applied his relentless energy to the conquest of acreage. Jackson, according to the documents that I found, obtained with his friends some 45,000 acres in what is now North Alabama uh, with different names on the titles at different times, turned them into a variety of plantations, created what is still a very vibrant world, a vibrant area, the Tennessee River Valley, and that was just one of his conquests, which he managed while serving both as a public official and a private real estate developer. Donald Trump. Um, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Um, he was, there's a conflict of interest, actually. It doesn't actually apply to Donald Trump, come to think of it. He's, he's, he's one man. He's very open about everything. This was a time when a man could be a public official, have private business interests. The notions of ethics were different. The notions of ethics were very different. And somewhat in secret, but partly in the open, he and his friends were colonizing this new world and they were changing the map. This battle would extend to become a great national controversy after his election as president in 1828. His election was momentous because no man from such humble beginnings had ever risen so far. It was a significant watershed in American history. It was part of a process that unleashed tremendous energy in the country, and Jackson also took care, took uh, advantage, rather, of this process in new and creative ways. He was an avid newspaper reader. He subscribed to as many as 17 newspapers at a time and would save articles, clip them out, uh, and send them to people later to offer information to smite an enemy or to encourage people to move along. As his political faction became what is now known as the Democratic Party, there would be more and more newspapers that were Jacksonian newspapers. There was an ideology being spread through this new media. A rapidly growing population was redefining what it meant to be an American, redefining the government of the United States and what it was to stand for, emphasizing the idea of democracy, which as many of you will know, Many of the founding fathers had been quite skeptical of. They did not set up a system with the United States Constitution of pure democracy. The system would become more democratic in the age of Jackson. But it was an explicitly white democracy. And that became ever more explicit in this same period, which is why 
Also, this feels to me like a profoundly modern story because what we had at that moment was people in a very diverse country trying to figure out how to make sure that everyone's rights were protected, but that the country still held together as a single nation. You can appreciate the challenge that they faced and still fiercely criticized the answers, the solutions they came up with. Another map will show that solution in one way. We've seen the white man's map of 1812. We've seen the Indian map of 1812. This is what I call Jackson land. This is a slightly different twist on the modern map of the United States. The land that is marked out there is all land that Andrew Jackson was personally involved in obtaining from Indian nations through wars, through treaty negotiations as a peacetime general, then as president of the United States. It is part or all of, I believe, seven states, Florida, much of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, bit of North Carolina. It's an empire. And it was added to the United States in this era between 1812 and 1838, which is the date of the Trail of Tears. It's, a, to me, a vital and incredible story, and it continues to go on. There's one more thing I want to say about this region I call Jackson Land before I invite your questions. And it's this. All the Indian nations were removed from Jackson Land. And yet, when you travel Jackson Land today, you find Indians. You can travel to Cherokee, North Carolina, and find the descendants of a band of Cherokees who avoided removal in 1838 and were finally allowed to stay in some of the most remote parts of the mountains, and they're still in the far western tip of North Carolina. And Cherokee, North Carolina, rather than being a place where Cherokees hide, is a tourist town with moccasin shops and a gigantic Harris casino uh, and really charming people in a lovely museum, the Museum of the Cherokee Indian. Cherokee culture is, is upheld there rather than being driven underground. You will find groups of people who claim Indian ancestry, large groups of them in Alabama and other places who aren't even recognized by the Cherokee Nation, which is now centered in Oklahoma but people are there and proudly claiming their Indian ancestry. And that leads to another irony, which you can see in this photo that I took earlier this year when I was in Cherokee, North Carolina. This to me is kind of amazing because here we are, we're going into Jackson County, North Carolina, one of many things in Jackson land named after Jackson. There's a reason there's a Jackson, Mississippi, and a Jacksonville, Florida, and a Jackson County, Alabama, Jackson County, North Carolina, uh, and a Jacksonville, Alabama, a number of other places. We're going into Jackson County, North Carolina. But at the same time, we're going on to the Cherokee Indian Reservation, a chunk of land that has now been reserved to Cherokees once again. We have arrived more than a century later century and a half, closing in on two centuries even, at the world that John Ross, the young Cherokee leader, envisioned in 1816 when he wrote that we consider ourselves a part of the great family of the Republic of the United States. He spoke in later years of getting the Cherokee Nation to obtain territorial or ultimately state status as an American state. He spoke of Cherokees obtaining American citizenship, formal American citizenship, and somehow preserving their culture while remaining part of the wider American life. We could have a long discussion about the imperfections of what has happened today. Indian reservations, by and large, are the poorest places or among the poorest places in the United States, for example. But we now have the reality today that was envisioned back then of people holding on to bits of their ancient sovereignty and bits of their ancient culture while still participating in the wider American life. And let me show you one more photograph which suggests why this is a vital and important story for us today. It's also a photo 
from Cherokee, North Carolina. It's a few more signs. I love these signs because if you look over here, oh, I have a laser pointer. This is very exciting. Uh, right there you can see that the Cherokee language is on the street sign, Lambert Branch Road. You see it there in Cherokee underneath. You can see that uh, the restaurant there, Paul's Family Restaurant, is advertised as Indian-owned, and that the menu includes Indian tacos, which are really good. And you see the Our Lady of Guadalupe Catholic Church, where it says Sunday Mass, 9 o'clock, and it also says Misa en Español, Sábado, a las siete. Which represents another wave of migration coming to this same region, adding to it and perhaps transforming it over time once again. This is the challenge that we all face today in 2015. How do we create and continually recreate a country in which we respect everyone's individual rights and still hold together as one nation? It's the challenge we face now it's the challenge they faced then, and I believe there is much to learn from this bit of the past that's captured in Jackson Lamp. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I will be happy to take questions either until I get a signal to stop or until this book falls <laughs> off the perch that it's on. There are microphones at the side, as some of you have already seen. I would just ask two things. If you'd ask a direct question so we can keep the conversation going, and start by giving me your name so that we get to know each other a little bit. Why don't you go ahead, sir? Hi, I'm, I'm David Ruffin. Um, I, uh, I appreciate your uh, anecdote about John Ross's near um, traffic stop uh, on, the, on the boat ride. As a black man, I thought that was quite interesting. Thank you. Um, can you give us a little bit more about the, the mechanics of the Indian removal, what, what were some of the things uh, in terms of actually pushing them out? How did that happen? Thank it you. Um, amazingly happened, I'll use air quotes, voluntarily. And that was the idea, was to be profoundly humane, to push Indians to the west to Oklahoma for their own good. And there were Indians who believed this as well, by the way, that they were being destroyed by their contact with white civilization and that the best thing for them would be segregation. That wasn't the word that was used. It was called Indian Removal. And the Indian Removal Act was the first great legislation of Jackson's uh, presidency. But it was segregation. Let's put them off to the side where they won't be bothered by white men, and they'll stop, be, stop, stop drinking so much of the white man's alcohol. White people were unbelievably drunk at this time, but people were concerned about Indians being drunk. Um, and and they, can, they can restore their own cultures and govern themselves and not mess with the sovereignty of the United States, which was the other issue. But it was agreed that natives had rights and that they should not simply be forced out by war. And so there would be treaty negotiations. And these treaty negotiations would be profoundly unequal. Andrew Jackson was personally involved in a number of them as a general and then oversaw a number of them as president of the United States. And Jackson's technique was to go to Indians and say, uh, I'm your friend. Uh, I'm on your side. I think this is good for you. And I, I want to pay for your land. But if you don't hey, there's these white settlers who are coming over, and there's going to be nothing I can do to stop them, and you're, you're going to be destroyed. So what do you say? You can imagine that coercive situation. And that was the pattern of negotiations again and again. Uh, the Indians would fight back. And I should mention that John Ross had a very special way to fight back that, to me, is profoundly resonant of the African-American experience in America. The Cherokees, during the War of 1812, at the moment of Andrew Jackson's rise, were fighting in the War of 1812 on Andrew Jackson's side, on the side of the United States, in Andrew Jackson's army. And after the war, John Ross, on more than one occasion, reminded people in the government, hey, we, we fought for you. Now look after our rights. 
which is something that African Americans have tried in war after war after war after war with different levels of success. John Ross actually did enjoy some temporary success. So Cherokees and others pushed back. But there were treaty negotiations. The Cherokees founded a stronger government which more successfully resisted the treaty negotiations. So ultimately, Jackson's administration signed a treaty with a breakaway faction of Cherokees. And they were told uh, they had to be out by May 23, 1838. Um, now, it's hard to generalize because each nation's experience was somewhat different. But ultimately, the mechanics were a treaty would be signed, some process of law would be followed. And if that didn't work and people refused to leave, the troops would be sent. The Trail of Tears is an, an incredibly intricate and dramatic story, which in Jackson land, I think, turns out in subtle but important ways different than, than the short version did begin with soldiers forcing people out until they agreed to move voluntarily. The Seminoles had a full-on rebellion, and it ended up being a seven-year war, roughly the length of US combat involvement in Vietnam, before they ultimately agreed to leave. It was often quite brutal, but it was always legal, which is a reminder to be careful about what we call legal. I should mention also that this was challenged before the United States Supreme Court by the Cherokees. John Marshall, the Chief Justice of the United States in the 1830s, ruled in favor of the Cherokees, ruled that the Indian map was obviously the correct and legal map of the United States. And in short, the administration's, the Jackson administration's response to that ruling was to sidestep it and to find ways to get natives to sign treaties and sign their land away anyway. You can imagine if, after Brown versus Board of Education in the 1950s, the Eisenhower administration had said, yeah, I don't like this court ruling, and done things to undermine, undermine it, history would be very, very different. Let me go over to this side, sir. Hi, Steve. My name is Mark. Uh, you touched on a lot of what I was going to ask, but let me try to summarize it. Thank you sure. for that. Um, there were alliances that were tried, but because of battles that were hundreds of years or thousands of years, years between tribes, they couldn't consolidate. I'm curious, Ross had tried to uh, accommodate the whites and, and hopefully receive some type of benefit beyond the Trail of Cheers. Um, but what did other tribes think of the Cherokees in that regard, uh, since their attacks were obviously different and maybe more successful for them personally? Well, there were rivalries. Uh, sometimes you, when you look into the history, you see the Cherokees being allied with the Creeks, their neighbors, for example. Ultimately, they went different ways. And you make a good point. It was difficult for these nations to unite, even within themselves. And they faced challenges in doing that in an increasingly democratic age. The Cherokees were overwhelmingly behind John Ross. Every bit of evidence shows so. There were occasions in which thousands of them voted and voted overwhelmingly for John Ross. But they could not get every member of their elite to be on the same side forever. And ultimately, a few of the elites went off and signed a treaty. The Creeks were bitterly divided among themselves. But ultimately, a divide and conquer strategy worked there as well. There was a man named William McIntosh, who was an influential Creek who signed a treaty when his leaders would not. So there was an awful lot of, of divide and conquer going on. And it's worth remembering that even if all the southern Indians who were on that Indian map were united, their populations were never that large. And they had been devastated by smallpox and other white man's diseases, devastated by wars, by other factors. And there were maybe 50,000 of them against a country that was in the millions and growing by the millions every decade. They were going to be massively outnumbered no matter what. The Cherokees' genius, I think, even though it didn't work for them in the end, was to recognize that they, they couldn't say, we're all going to stick together and you know, massively resist. They couldn't say, we're going to go and fight a war. They'd be outnumbered. They'd lose. It was to fight within the emerging democratic system and to make noise within the emerging democratic system and attempt to divide the white population somewhat. And there, was, there were a few moments when they were near success. 
Uh, right over here, sir. Go ahead. Uh, my, a wonderful talk. But my name is Stephen Shore. My question is, when it became, in those instances, a matter of involvement by the U.S. Army in deportation, were there any instances where American soldiers refused to participate, and if so, were, how were they disciplined? Um, I cannot cite an exact act of civil disobedience, but I would commend to you, if you choose to buy the book, a chapter about John E. Wool, a general at that time, and I'm sure you could go find on your own if you don't wish to buy the book. Um, commanding general in charge of overseeing the preparations for removal. Uh, general Wool was willing to follow orders, but increasingly dismayed by the crazy scheme that he'd been caught up in and caught between the Jackson administration, which said, they're leaving by this date, get ready to do it, and the Cherokees, who said, we are not going anywhere. Our legal rights were upheld by the Supreme Court. The treaty we supposedly signed is bogus. We're not going anywhere, and you'll just have to kill us or something. I mean, they're just gonna, they're, they didn't say that exactly, but they said, we're not going anywhere. And you see Wool increasingly conflicted by the reality of what was being demanded of him. And at one point, he receives an order from the War Department in Washington saying if there is any officer who refuses to obey orders, you will discipline them severely. I have not come across in my research records that anyone in particular had to be disciplined. Um, but the very fact that such a warning would have to be made suggests what a close call it was. It was a very politicized act. It was an increasingly partisan age. It was a democratic administration. Many of the leading officers turned out to be Whigs, the other opposition party of that time. And so there were signs of discontent. But ultimately, uh, even Winfield Scott, the great American general who oversaw the removal, uh, even though he said this is clearly an unjust thing to do, he followed his orders. Right over here, sir. The times I visited, oh, Bruce Guthrie. Um, the times I visited the New Dakota uh, site, um, the, when they try to figure out basically good people, they point to the missionaries who always have this questionable past because they keep trying to undermine Indian culture. They mentioned John Ross and they mentioned the Supreme Court. But as you mentioned, John Ross had slaves. Are, are there actually any clear good guys in this story? Sure, just like our Congress today. <laughs> Politics is pretty brutal. Um, thank you for bringing up the missionaries. They're another part of this story. Um, yes, missionaries lived among the Indians. Missionaries played a large role in civilizing the Indians. And I'll just say that word the way it was used then, as an obvious good. Today, we see it as a more complex thing, don't we? Um, but in any case, missionaries were there. They were assisting in spreading literacy. They set up schools. They certainly also did not have a lot of respect for the original cultures. But missionaries became a vital part of this story. Really one of my favorite parts of the story, because missionaries were sent to the Cherokees to bring the civilization of the white man to Cherokees. But the Cherokees flipped the missionaries and ultimately used them as a network that got the messages of Cherokees out to the broader white community, which was essential because it was a democracy. And if you're a minority, you've got to have friends. You've got to have allies. And the missionaries became their friends. Two of them were imprisoned for refusing to follow a law of the state of Georgia that demanded that they leave Cherokee territory unless they had a proper license from the state. That actually became the heart of the Supreme Court case that the Cherokees won. There was a man who was not precisely a missionary, but a sort of editor and evangelist and, uh, and, and, and activist and fundraiser for missionaries named Jeremiah Everts, who wrote about two dozen newspaper articles that were spread across the United States in a way that articles rarely ever had been defending Cherokee rights and doing so in a very straightforward manner, acknowledging their equality as human beings and even making obvious references to the Declaration of Independence and its phrase about all men are created equal. So I would agree with the suggestion you made in the question that the missionaries were surely patronizing in many ways and surely did not have a lot of views that we would necessarily agree with today, but there are some heroic characters there. 
And I would argue that even my two main characters, as terribly flawed as they are, are each in their own way heroic in standing up for the cause that they stood for and in going through great trials to get as far as they did. I am so glad that a woman has finally stepped up to the microphone. If there are any other women who want to like speak up, because we should have like you know every kind of person here. Please go ahead, ma'am. Um, I wanted to say that um, the progress of African Americans in the United States uh, took a big leap when Martin Luther King was smart enough to let uh, um, put our plight in front of the media and let the rest of America know what was going on. Uh, one of the problems that I think that Native Americans have now is that America really does not know the history that is covered in your book. Uh, do you think that there will ever be a time when Americans will be concerned, more concerned and educated about what really happened to the Native Americans, which will allow them to perhaps go to court and get some money back from the land that was stole from them? Thanks for the question. Uh, I have what you may read as a somewhat hopeful answer to that, because one of the things that is great about studying this topic is that it's been written about for almost 200 years. And so you get 200 years of different perspectives about Indian removal. It was a huge controversy at the time. Another of the Cherokee's innovations was to start their own newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix, which had articles in Cherokee and in English and was distributed to other newspapers across the country. They got the word out to a large degree at the time. Not enough, apparently, but to a large degree. People heard their point of view. Now, in the couple of centuries almost that followed, there have been a variety of treatments of this topic. There's a man named James Parton, a British biographer of Andrew Jackson, who wrote a great three-volume biography of Andrew Jackson. And Indian removal is a couple of pages in which he says, I hope by now, the 1850s, everyone agrees that it was obviously wise and humane to do this, to get the poor Indians out of the way of advancing civilization and move them to the West where they could at least not die out. In the 1890s, there was a popular history of the United States in this period which suggested that it was natural that white men would not want this independent Indian government in their midst, and it all but excused subverting the law to get rid of them. The author of that book was Woodrow Wilson, and his book was still in print when he became president. Um, in 1913, there is a Georgia textbook that I came across, a school textbook, which describes slave owners as, as a class, the most moral and humane men who ever walked the face of the earth. Just made a couple mistakes along the way. And, um, and goes on to simply describe Indian removal as a practical necessity. White men needed land, so this is what they did. Sounds like a Virginia school textbook. Well, there may be. I'm sure there were in other, other uh, states as well. But that has changed over time. That's where I'm going with this sad tale. In the 1930s, uh, the Great Depression, when you have this period of questioning you know, what's going on in America, you begin to see these texts where people write about Indian removal as a thing that's worth studying. And you begin to find out that there was an ethnologist who lived among the Cherokees in the 1880s and gathered some of the stories of the oldest people who were still alive then, and that there was a record to go on. This was built on further in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, the whole period of revisionist history in the United States. You could argue that it went too far. Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States dwells at great length on Andrew Jackson and on Indian removal includes, I'm sad to say, a lot of facts that I could not verify, that I couldn't find in the records that I looked at. I'm not saying he made stuff up. I'm just saying it's, it's just hard to see where he got some of the claims that he got. And it seems to me that the actual record is devastating enough. I don't need to come up with unverifiable things. And, <clears throat> you know, modern biographers of Andrew Jackson <clears throat> I think have done a much better job. H.W. Brands comes to mind. John Meacham comes to mind. They may like Jackson. They may dislike Jackson a little bit. But they include the devastation that was Indian removal. 
Um, and in 2009, as you may know, President Obama signed a formal apology for acts such as the Trail of Tears. Now it was quietly done and attached to a defense authorization bill. And to your other point, included language that specifically said, I'm paraphrasing here, but specifically said that nothing in this act shall be used as a basis to file a claim or try to recover land. Um, so this contrition is only going to go so far. But I would suggest that uh, the debate has been healthy over time. It's been a 200-year argument. It's moving in the right direction. And I would like to think that this story adds something to it because we learn here that Cherokees were more than mere victims on the Trail of Tears. They were people who acted in their own defense and who in many ways set a heroic example for us today. Thank you. And I guess that's a good spot to end. Thank you very much for coming up. Thank you. And thanks for those watching at home. And folks, just a reminder, there is a book signing following the program today. We'll see you upstairs at the Archives Bookstore in a few minutes. Treaties that you talk about are being um, shown at the American Indi Indian Museum. Those treaties belong here at the National Archives. So one um, a month, I believe, for the next year are being shown. So it's bringing a whole new audience to what the U.S. government promised um, these Indians and did not deliver on. So um, there's some work going on there.